So previously we've done our Lewis dots and our Lewis dot structures where we did a single atom and we figured out where the electrons would be around it. But now we're going to start stitching atoms together to build entire Lewis structures. So a Lewis dot structure for a molecule or a polyatomic ion. Now there's a careful caution that I want you to keep in mind anytime you're dealing with a Lewis structure. It's a flatland representation of how the molecule is connected. It's not really how it's shaped. It's all about the connections. It's like squashing a subway map and just showing the connections between the different terminals. It doesn't tell you actual distances necessarily. It doesn't tell you three dimensionally which line is on top of the other one or when you're going to take an escalator. It doesn't show any of that. So it's a little bit like for this molecule. If I squash it in flat land, it looks like it's kind of a cross shape, right? But when I stop squashing it, it actually ends up having kind of a tripod shape. This is going to be a really critical thing to keep in mind as we go forward, because until we get into three dimensions, we can't say anything about its properties because it's not yet the way that it's really shaped in the world and so it can't interact with its neighbors in a realistic fashion. Lewis structure, figure out how it's connected. Three-dimensional structure, figure out how it interacts with the world. Okay, now we're gonna start out simply when we draw these. We're gonna start out by assuming at the beginning that everything's got single bonds. We're gonna to work to a point where we say, you know, I can't move any further forward unless I consider the idea of multiple bonds. And that's the point where we'll start considering drawing in a double bond or a triple bond. Now there'll be times where we can anticipate it and we'll see which atoms we should expect that for. But remember, we're not going to be focused on that right away. So here's the first step we gotta do. We have to write down the formula because we don't know what we're working with till we have the formula in front of us. And once we know what the formula is, I can look up each of my relative electronegativities. I can either see the real values or I can just be aware of how they should be different by looking at a periodic table. If you don't have the electronegativities in front of you, that's fine. You know fluorine is the super electronegative one. You know carbon's middle of the road and hydrogen is about the same. You know that as you go down the periodic table, it becomes lower in electronegativity. And you also know that as you come over to the, let's see, uh, to the left-hand side of the periodic table, electronegativity also drops. The upper right is high electronegativity. Most of the time you'll be able to figure out the relative electronegativity just by looking at where it's at on the periodic table. Now the next thing you need to do is you need to draw your most electronegative, sorry, your least electronegative atom in the middle, though it can never be hydrogen. Why can't it be hydrogen? Well remember, hydrogen has one proton. If it shares any electrons, it's gonna have two electrons. And that's all that it can manage. So how can it be a central atom if it can only bond, be bound to one thing? It's just not going to happen. It's not going to pick up multiple bonds, so it can never be in the center. Now, the reason the least electronegative goes in the center. Remember my analogy for money and how bonding works. I keep describing this as being a bit like a thieving situation where the really electronegative atom steals from the one that has poor electronegativity. Well, if you have a victim and you've got four muggers, who's gonna be in the middle? It's not gonna be the muggers, is it? It's going to be the victim. Similarly, the atom that can't take electrons is gonna be swarmed around by the atoms that can take the electrons. So your least electronegative atom goes in the middle. Now, go off to the margin of your paper and add up all your valence electrons, or better to say, all the atom all the electrons you have counting towards your octet, depending on what distinction you're making. I'll leave it written as valence here, but make sure that you're thinking through it like that. It all depends on which source you're using uh, for your textbook. Okay, now next up, we're going to draw one single bond from the central atom to all of your other bonds. Why? Well, because you aren't drawing this just for fun, right? You're doing it to try to figure out the structure of something and it's able to hold together, you're assuming there's a bond. So draw the bond in. Could it be a double or triple? Absolutely, we don't know that yet, but we'll figure it out in a minute when we say, what strategy would this molecule use to optimize where the electrons are and get the most stability?
that's going to be the next steps. So now you're going to start drawing in all of your remaining electrons, probably as electron pairs at the beginning. And then eventually you'll start drawing in electrons in bonds until everything's got its octet rule fulfilled. Now that's assuming that you've got enough electrons to keep going. If you run out of electrons partway through, that tells you something important too, and it tells you that you're going to have to make a double bond somewhere. Now, a quick strategy that I want to add in there too. Give, don't worry about giving electrons to your central atom yet. If your central atom only has six electrons when you count up all the bonds, it's not that big of a deal. All the outer electrons, you can always pick one of those pairs to erase and redraw as a double bond, which would get your central atom to be an octet like it should be. Now, we'll see that in action when we do a couple of examples. Now, it also is helpful to have a reality check. And here's what that reality check is. Usually, hydrogen is going to get one bond. Why? Like I described before, it's got one proton. It's going to max out at about two electrons, right? So it's not going to need more than one bond to end up being filled. Carbon usually gets four bonds. Why? Because it's got four, oct uh, four toward its octet. If it can share four times, it gets up to its octet number and it becomes very stable. Nitrogen, exactly the same logic. It's got five electrons. That means two of them are paired, three of them are not. So we need to make three bonds in order to share and make those three electrons into a pair. Oxygen, same logic, six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, and six. These two are paired. These two are unpaired. We need to get an extra electron for each of these to become pairs. And so it can share and make a total of two bonds. That could be a double bond, one, or it could be two single bonds. Either one would be fine. All of our halogens over there in group seven typically get one bond. Same kind of logic as hydrogen had. They've got seven electrons already. If they share one time, congratulations, you're up to eight. That's it but there are going to be lots of exceptions. So use this as a starting point just to help guide your eye, but be aware that you're going to have lots of times where other things happen. We'll talk about that in other videos when we talk about expanded octets, when we talk about electron deficient atoms, and also we're just going to have times where we start doing some other funky things with it. So be aware that these are to guide your eye. They are not rules at the bottom. This is a strategy for drawing a good structure, and it works really well, but it itself does not tell physics how to interact. Physics made the molecule. These rules are trying to explain it.